back to Nick for a second. My uh, apologies, really, because I'm going to give a presentation, and as Peter has already mentioned, obviously, you've got a number of other presentations going on, and I wasn't sure whether there'd be an audience, and if there was, how many people would be in it. So I'm going to keep this very general. So for those who are uh, interested in the science behind this, there will be more opportunities later, I'm sure, for discussion and, and comment and feedback. But I wanted to tell you about a project which uh, is on the, on the screen, I think, coming up shortly, the Cross of the Future <laughs> Research Centre, which I, thank you, which I've been very much involved in setting up and developing since I went to Nottingham, since I went to Nottingham, Malaysia, uh, almost four years ago, actually, September 2008. I went there as Vice Provost for Research, uh, and at the same time, Malaysia was, or the University of Nottingham actually, along with Biodiversity International, was selected to host an international centre, which I think is a bit of an extravagant title for it, but an entity, let's call it, called Crops of the Future. So I'm going to describe a particular element of that, uh, and, and Peter was, um, was mentioning this small campus. This small campus <laughs> is the University of Nottingham's Malaysia campus in the background there which is actually quite a large campus, about 300 acres of land available, <laughs> and about 75 nationalities of students, and about 40 uh, nationalities of staff, and about 5,000 staff and students working there, all registered and part of the University of Nottingham, all the 12,000 kilometers south of Nottingham in the UK. But what I'm going to talk about is this entity here, which is the Crops for the Future Research Center, and this is still in the uh, artist's eye, because this, this picture doesn't actually exist, but it will be developed and built in the next 12 to 18 months, I'm sure, by the uh, architects and planners and, and uh, contractors that we've appointed to build this centre. The important point I think I want to make, and I'll refer back to, is this piece of land here is legally separate from the University of Nottingham. The University of Nottingham is a guarantor, but not an owner. So this bit that I'm going to describe is actually a private company, and I'd be interested in, in how that model might relate to, to, to other areas of science where company might actually be involved in doing research, contracted to work with universities such as Nottingham, uh, which provide additional facilities, but don't own the company. Um, we're going to have a problem with the, uh, the uh, background to this, so, sorry, it was white 20 minutes ago, but it's now black. Never mind, it's gonna, I'm just going to give you, because of course there's all stuff everybody here in this room knows anyway, but uh, forgive me that the slide has changed colour, but it's only to give you a very brief context to what I'm going to describe, and it's, it's information that, of course, everyone here is familiar with, but it gives me a basis on which I can actually describe the research now. What it would show are the numbers that are here. There's something between 350 and 500,000 species in the plant kingdom, 7,000 of which at some point we have cultivated or used or consumed as crops, what we might call uh, plants for food or non-food uses. Of those, 20 crops dominate the major crops of the world, and as few as three crops, wheat, rice, and maize, actually produce about 60% of the world's diet in terms of calorific intake. So more than half the world's food comes from three species, and 90% of the world's food comes from fewer than 100 species. Now, there are very good reasons for that, and we might turn around and say, well, of course, all those other plants which we've looked at have no inherent value because if they were any good, we would have discovered them by now. Uh, I think there's a very short-sighted and circular argument. We've actually not invested the type of research we've spent correctly, in, uh, of course, in, in most cases, on these big crops. We've never really invested in these small crops. So we've never really taken them as seriously as we might. And one question might be, in the climate of the future, maybe we should consider these plants now as potential plants which we really get assigned to history or germplasm collections in the past. The other point work that I've been involved in and, and others have been in the physiology of intercrops and multiple cropping systems, but of course the world is dominated by single crops made up of identical plants of the same species, the same variety, growing, growing next door to identical individuals. So in our recent past, we moved from hunter-gathering and agro-silvo pastoral systems through agroforestry, which of course is still a relevant, relevant uh, uh, activity for international research centres, Eater cropping and soil cropping. In fact, when I was at Icrisat, that was many years ago, most of my research actually was on intercropping, and that really interested me because in biological system efficiency, 
into crops often are more productive than soil cult uh, cultivation, but of course in economic terms that may not be the case. What it does lead to, of course, is a loss of system and genetic diversity because we now replace our complex multiple history of agricultural systems with the soil cropping or monoculture that now dominates world agriculture. And if I flew over the UK, I would see, albeit not from this angle, something that looks like this. For most part of the agricultural scene, it would be three or four major crops grown as monocultures. And interestingly, when I land at the airport and I go back to Kale on Thursday and Tuesday, I'll see this scene. And I'll see another monoculture, albeit a plantation crop, all palm, but a plantation crop that is actually one, one uh, comment most people give me is, why should we look at alternative crops? And I say, well, oil palm was an alternative crop to Malaysia once, because 80 years ago there was no oil palm in Malaysia. It's now the dominant 4.9 million hectares of land in Malaysia is occupied by a monoculture of what was once a crop for the future, because 80 years ago it wasn't a major crop outside uh, parts of West Africa. So, third stage, which I think is perhaps the most important the one I know least about, is knowledge systems, and currently on the planet there are about 6,000 spoken languages. But interestingly, and I'm speaking number three now, three languages dominate, seven languages are spoken by more than half the planet. So in terms of knowledge systems, we need to recognize that this one language, the very famous paper given by an uh, ethno-linguist called uh, Tobe Skutna, and her title is English colon the killer language. I think what she means is knowledge systems. What she's saying is the knowledge in English is, of course, the knowledge of science now. And increasingly, that knowledge displaces not mentioning the other written languages, which increasingly are displaced in terms of publications and scientific uh, correspondence, but the unwritten languages. The vernacular languages that are in people's heads disappear faster than the genetic resources those people actually cultivate. So the idea that knowledge should actually be reposited in just one language is an extremely risky strategy for us because the knowledge systems that exist in people's heads and elsewhere in the world, for instance in this lady's head here, her knowledge will die with her because her children have moved almost certainly from Sarawak, where she's from, and they will have changed the language they speak and of course the knowledge that she will have passed on to them generationally can only be lost once because once she stops speaking that language and her children certainly don't speak it, the knowledge in that language is lost forever. So I think we have a much more uh, risky strategy in consolidating all scientific knowledge in one language, albeit the communication uh, convenience of that uh, language is great, but the knowledge systems are then uh, lost or corrupted when they're translated from the knowledge of people's heads to the language that I'm now speaking to you. So just to contextualize everything, we now consider science as communicated in a single language, variations of English. Our scientific discourse is heavily dominated by fundamental sciences, I would say disproportionately in terms of the biotechnology and uh, techniques that we have here, at the risk that these other disciplines that we still consider as scientific, uh, we might consider as uh, physiology and agronomy, cropping systems, maybe marketing, product development, etc., are very rarely linked up in this sort of research value chain, we think of our subjects as silos, disciplines that we're comfortable in, but we rarely communicate beyond. Three species and one system. So just as a context, we've reduced or our reductionism of the last generation, and it's not been very long since we had many languages, uh, subjects that weren't in uh, scientific silos, many species and many agricultural systems. So. The speed at which this has happened has actually been very dramatic and I don't think we've quite taken stock of how quickly our agricultural sciences have actually been transformed in the last 30 to 60 years. So, how does that take us to the context of crops of the future? We've never had so few species for so many people and of course you're all familiar with the statistic that was announced in November last year when uh, the United Nations announced the seventh billionth person on the planet. I don't know quite how accurate that is. But if we give it one, you know, plus or minus 5% percent that's a lot of people, their prediction is by 2050 there will be 9 billion people on the planet. So we've got seven species currently feeding more than half the population of the planet. And uh, that's a question to ask what happens in the agriculture and food systems of the 2050s and beyond. 
can we actually rely on these wonderful major crops and the seven species that now feed us, or will they be the seven species that will feed the nine billion plus people in the next 50 years? So few languages, so many people, and again, it has to be written to be communicated because no longer do we communicate verbally. Information has to be uh, put into scientific publications, websites, social language, uh, networks, etc., all using written forms, and that written form is increasingly in very few uh, linguistic uh, systems. And the usual elephant in the room is the climate change, climate of the future. And I think the only useful point I want to make here is because we all will say, well, agricultural diversity is very important. And what I'm really saying is, are we serious about it? Because we talk about agricultural biodiversity, we talk about preserving germplasm, we talk about international efforts to conserve agricultural biodiversity, but do we actually mean that in any serious sense? And maybe it's time now for us to take stock of that and say, should we seriously reconsider the diversity of agricultural and knowledge systems? That means, should we do research on it rather than treat it as a public good that we should conserve? usual phrase, use it or lose it. Should we use agricultural biodiversity more to conserve it rather than keep it in uh, germplasm collections? Probably out of date and you're more familiar with this diagram than I am, but the International Centres and CG system has, uh, and I was just uh, briefly talking this morning and it reminds me of the same principle, no global institution specifically responsible for research, uh, and it's tripped off the edge there on this format, I'm sorry, but the the missing word is crops, <laughs> which is actually quite relevant. No global institution responsible for research on unutilized crops. And the word there, research, is the relevant point. Biodiversity, of course, based in Rome, with many uh, regional offices. I'm not sure the biodiversity office on, on the Crisata or, or here you have a biodiversity association. But principally, biodiversity's relationship is to conserve and promote and uh, advocate the use of agricultural biodiversity. It doesn't have a research mandate to actually do research in agricultural biodiversity and particularly <coughs> unutilized crops. So an opportunity emerged about four years ago and there was an international call, which interestingly Eucharist had bid as well, but about 11 international centres and two or three non-international centres bid to host an entity which some of you may have heard of its predecessor, the International Centre for Unutilized Crops. A lady called Hannah Janik has set up an international center, albeit with only two people employed, in Colombo, Sri Lanka, supported by the UK Government Department for International Development. At the same time, there was a, a global facilitation unit for unutilized crops hosted in Rome by Biodiversity International. And the two decided this really wasn't very sensible to have two very small units working on unutilized crops, and they issued an international call for a hosting agency, because Sri Lanka itself at the time, the International Water Management Institute, didn't seem appropriate, uh, and an institute in Rome didn't seem appropriate to host an international center for which most plants are actually in the uh, humid and uh, semi-arid and arid tropics. So the call was to host an international entity called Crops of the Future. Eleven, in fact, 13 agencies bid for that, shortlist of three, and to cut long story short, the final selection was Biodiversity International and the University of Nottingham, which was actually the only non-CG centre that bid, and we only bid as a research partner. We didn't bid to host the, the, inter uh, you know, the full entity. We actually were interested in research on the crop. So the two selected partners were Biodiversity International's Asia Pacific Oceana office in Kuala uh, Lumpur in Malaysia, and the University of Nottingham's Malaysia campus, of course, in Malaysia. And they were selected to host this entity called Crops of the Future, Global Mandate, and Biodiversity International with the Advocacy and Communication Mandate, and the University of Nottingham in Malaysia with the Research Mandate. And it's a massive mandate. Any food or non-food crop not supported by international centers. So basically any of those 7,000 species that uh, have been used or could be used for agriculture. So, hosting is one thing, delivering is another, and being given, uh, if you like, permission to host an international entity is great. But if there's no resource and there's no backup, then of course it, it's just a, a main place on a door. Why Malaysia? A number of reasons, the last of which is the most important, I suspect. But first of all, Malaysia, for those who don't know it personally, is the second mega, most mega diverse region in the world. 
After Brazil, it has the largest number of indigenous plants and animal species. And of course, it has an enormous agroecological transect because it sits here in a huge transect of biodiversity right across this part of, the, of this hemisphere. It is a country that is relatively stable. It has very good infrastructure and national research capacity. So uh, given some of our discussions about where to host international and national centers, uh, Malaysia is as good as any in terms of stability and long-term prospects. Of course, it has this huge repository of knowledge and plants. It is the largest, I suspect, living laboratory of plant and knowledge system anywhere because it's got languages, it's got vernacular and ethnobotanical knowledge, and it's got 18,000 indigenous plants, of uh, uh, higher plants. Surprisingly, at the equator, you might think, well, of course, it's the humid tropics, but I can vouch for the fact that you can go to alpine climates, because if you walk up Mount Kinabalu at the equator, you go from not quite, uh, well, you go from sea level, of course, which is uh, the humid tropics, up to alpine climates at the top, all at the same latitude. So there's a huge agroecological gradient without having to go very far, it's not very far in terms of latitude. So here's a natural laboratory of natural plants and natural knowledge, which as far as I'm concerned anywhere on the planet, it's, it's difficult to see a greater diversity in a very short distance. Third most important reason is funding. Without funding, of course, we're all uh, aware of the fact that we haven't got resources, we can't do things. So when we actually were given permission to host crops for the future, the very first job was to actually engage, as you notice, the University of Nottingham in Malaysia is a public university in Nottingham, the UK, private university in Malaysia, but it's not a Malaysian entity, it's actually a private entity. And of course, Biodiversity International is an international agency which is actually not based in Malaysia. So our first task was to actually govern, to engage the government in Malaysia. And by so doing, we were able to establish, uh, I think, a unique relationship because the outcome of this is the establishment of a research centre which is a legally private company called Crops of the Future Research Centre. So whilst it is the research arm of Crops of the Future, it's a company limited by guarantee without share capital. And though I know nothing about business till I started doing this, what that actually means is there are guarantors who don't own the company. They guarantee its long-term future in terms of resource support case of university enormous research infrastructure of course. What it also means without share capital is there's no dividends to shareholders. So the research investment is returned as research activity. There is no benefit to shareholders. Even more, and I think this is unique, in Malaysia if anyone invests in a research company, and there are very few registered research companies, they can claim their tax back. In fact they can claim twice their tax back. So if anyone here wants to set up a company in Malaysia and donate a million dollars, they can claim two million dollars back in tax relief. Now that's extremely important, of course, because that's a public investment which actually costs the uh, investor nothing. In fact, they benefit from it. The biggest investor is the government of Malaysia, which has invested 40 million dollars in this project. So the investment allows us to set up a research center for uh, alternative crops or unutilized crops with funding guaranteed to 2017 funding to build the facilities and the operational costs for running it. And I think in any current economic climate, that's a massive investment. But to do it on underutilized crops, crops that have no uh, international uh, sort of uh, um, lobby group or, or agency supporting them is actually a, a unique investment. Mandate is for underutilized crops, alternative crops for food and non-food uses. Of course, food is primary, feed and nutrition and health but also energy and biomaterials. So anything we want to do on alternative crops is the mandate of the CFF, and particularly the research centre. Product marketing, making things out of plants and making products out of them, valuable or public use or uh, end uses that may be of value without, without necessarily commercial return. And capacity building. Building research strength on unutilized crops that previously would never have had research investment the techniques, particularly on major crops, that can be applied to minor crops in a coherent and structured way rather than the random way that's currently been done, allows us to build enormous capacity without reinventing the wheel on every single underutilized crop. Experience of major crops can be applied to minor crops if we know what we're looking for.
Major developments, I'll take you through briefly, the 2011, 2011 uh, June 27th, Prime Minister Dato Sri Najib Tun Razak, Prime Minister of Malaysia, launched the Prospect Future Research Centre, a major conference. I think there were some Equisat colleagues there actually. About 400 delegates came from all over the world to our, our first international conference held in Kuala Lumpur where the centre was actually launched. We then entered a period of about six months of dialogue, which was actually supported by the Asian Development Bank very generously, where we had stakeholder dialogue, webinars, international meetings in Manila and Kuala Lumpur to discuss the strategy for Props of the Future Research Centre. The company was actually established in August last year. The chairman was appointed and I was appointed as CEO on the 1st of August. We launched our research strategy. I borrowed very few copies of it, and the rest will be available on, the, on the, um, soft copies will be available on our website. But Peter may select some lucky recipients of our, our brochure, our hard copy at the end of the uh, seminar. If you're interested, we can send you further copies. Facilities are now being planned, and I'll describe those briefly. And I want to tell you a little bit about our research programs that we've just uh, developed, and particularly the scholarship program, which I'm going to describe to you, the uh, CIFRC 250 plus scholarships, which hopefully at the end of the seminar will be self-evident what that uh, title actually means. Strategy, lots of species, lots of plants, lots of systems, plus biotechnology through to end use is a very large uh, remit, if you like. And our strategy is based on three themes, knowledge systems, particularly using digital technologies and non-conventional sources of knowledge across the value chain on indigenous plants, on indigenous plants. Nutrition, of course we're all interested in food security, global food security, but actually the role of unutilized plants is very significant in terms of their value, in terms of the nutrition they can provide or enhance in terms of the food basket, consumption patterns of people who increasingly consume fewer and fewer plants. Uh, and most of those are increasingly processed into different products. And of course we have to make some of these plants into commercially valuable products and therefore moving plants up the value chain is a perfectly valid uh, and uh, desirable outcome of research on unutilized crops. So a commercial direct, if you like, a commercial pull to make plants into <coughs> higher value products is actually a very good uh, discipline for us to, to see why we should be working on these crops. Briefly, the research centre, and over the next 18 months, uh, one of our most exciting tasks will be to build a centre. So I mentioned what it looks like. There's the campus of the university, already full of laboratories, libraries, computer facilities, accommodation, refectories, sports facilities. None of that needs to be duplicated. So the research centre here is being built adjacent to the university and will contract facilities from the university as we need. None of them will be duplicated where the university already has them. What we'll do is build a new centre here with complementary facilities exclusively dedicated to unutilized crop research. So the facility we develop here will be in addition to the university and that legal boundary here means we actually have to buy those facilities. We don't get them free. We contract them and I'll show you how we're going to buy them. This actually here will be a botanical garden of alternative crops, in other words, a visitor centre here in the humid tropics, I should say, there in the humid tropics, we actually can grow pretty much anything under different conditions. So we can actually have biomes in which we control climates, we have gardens in which we can grow crops of the future. Crops, not just, uh, if you like, interesting plants, but plants that actually may have some commercial uh, nutritional end product value. And the facility will be unusual in terms of the research we do is on alternative plants and we will use alternative principles in the construction of the facilities. We'll use green energy efficient structures, we'll recycle natural rainwater, and it will be the first carbon neutral research centre in Southeast Asia. Now the design is, I think, quite exciting and this is really what it's going to look like. And we'll have three domes. One will be a visitor and administration dome in which we actually hope to bring a lot of people, particularly public and young people in, to see their crops and see the plants that they actually grow long way, sometimes not so far away from them, but in inaccessible parts of the rainforest. We're going to have laboratory domes, a laboratory dome, and a research uh, dome in which we have all of our uh, research staff and students. So, technology actually should allow us to reduce the energy cost of this building because we're using this uh, wooden frame, ventilated, 
in which internally we have our laboratories and offices and buildings, recycle rainwater from our lake, and green roofs. So we actually grow plants on our roofs of the laboratories and facilities in town. So just imagine that facility is, is now approved for construction and will be building in the next 15 months. Hopefully by the end of next year we'll be installed in our new centre uh, next to the campus. And that's really uh, what we uh, intended to look like and that's already approved for construction. What are we going to do in it? Now this is very brief so I'm going to apologise because there's going to be a really quick uh, sort of synopsis of our programmes. You remember I mentioned we had to set up a research uh, strategy and our research strategy was those three themes of the sustainable nutrition, knowledge systems and high value agriculture. Now those are themes, they're not programmes. Our programmes have to fit within those themes. And I think perhaps the most important initial investment is in this web-based platform of knowledge. So we already have spent about six months developing a web-based platform which should become the repository or the first point of reference for knowledge and unutilized crops. Knowledge in every form, because all of these technologies already exist, to map crops, where can we grow them, where can we find them, what can we make out of them, how do we breed them, all of the agronomic physiological strategies for growing them. All of that, if you like, is a knowledge base which we can use from conventional published or experimental evidence that we collect. Key feature will be how we include the qualitative, how we include the indigenous and the vernacular knowledge with our knowledge systems in the more conventional, so-called conventional sense. So this integration of integrate integration of indigenous and uh, conventional scientific evidence is really what we're aiming for. Filtered, if you like, in terms of quality control, linked in terms of scientific uh, experimental evidence, and then made public. So that that information is made public in almost every case where there is a public value to that research rather than purely a commercial interest in it. So that knowledge system is actually a very important tool that we've already invested. We will put a number of postdoctoral and postgraduate research students and all our projects that I'll describe in our programs will actually be underpinned by this crop-based knowledge system. In other words, all the information we collect from every program will be included in our crop-based uh, knowledge system. So here's crop-based, that's our sort of linking knowledge system and at the moment we have identified five programs for research and it's those five programs that I'll mention because we will invest heavily in studentships and research opportunities primarily, not exclusively, but primarily in those five programs. So here's our crop-based, I've mentioned that to you, we already have uh, some uh, significant investment in, in, in human resources to develop that. Let me now just mention briefly these three, uh, three uh, value-added, high-value agriculture projects and two uh, nutrition-related projects. Those are, the, those are the ones that we've actually uh, launched already. So quick, very quick uh, scan through the, the issue. Biomass Plus, and, and I'll mention it again later on, but the term there, Plus, uh, relates to an acronym providing links to unutilized species. So our purpose here is to look at, in this case, biomass, because the government of Malaysia has announced an enormous uh, investment in alternative energy. And it sees alternative energy not from solar or from wind or from other sources, but from biomass, and from this huge plantation sector, this 4.9 million hectares of oil palm, which is currently used, of course, for oil, but not for biomass and not for alternative energy. So our purpose here is to look at how we can assist the oil palm sector in providing other species that complement biomass from oil palm. Oil palm will always be the dominant crop, so it's going to be oil palm plus, if you like, other species. And our research centre then can actually act as a one-stop shop to identify which species will work either on land that's not suited to oil palm, or better still, underutilised in oil palm itself. We've got this huge repository of land currently occupied by oil palm, is there space in it or before it or after it that we can actually grow other vegetation, both for the ecosystem services they provide, particularly for the commercial opportunities they get. Novel sources, not currently used for biomass, novel biomass species that can be introduced from outside to Malaysia, so a generic program, an international program. So, very close to home for me scientifically, whenever I look at an oil palm plantation I say, what about all this here? because that's of no interest to the oil palm sector, 
but it is interesting to us as ecologists and physiologists because plants are growing there. So the idea that this monoculture kills everything else is simply not true. There is space, and that is unused. There's not just space. There's, of course, a huge, enormous biomass recycling going on in this very humid tropical environment. And that space plus this opportunity to actually reuse or recycle or provide other sources of biomass other than these trunks is actually very exciting for us. And not least, this. And if you look at any developed, fast developing country like Malaysia, it's crisscrossed with electricity pilots. And in that 4.9 million hectares, at any time 5% of that area is occupied by non-biomass, non-oil non palm, because oil palm is not allowed to be grown under electricity pilots. No crop can be grown taller than three meters below electricity pilots, because the electricity service has to actually reach those pilots. Now, if you take that 5% of 4.9 million hectares, that is a huge amount of land not being used for cultivation. And our idea is actually to use that, plus, of course, the space in it and the space before it, because all one takes three years before the canopy closes. And that is a huge agroecological opportunity for us to do really good scientific research on resource use efficiency, resource capture conversion efficiency, introduction of species, and their biological and commercial and economic potential in alternative energy potential uh, in, in all I'll skim through these. It's only the, the traffic light is really the thing to indicate. So here's our crop base, scoping, technology, implementation. All our projects are driven by an end use. So alternative crops are not just alternatives. They're actually providing a drive that the commercial sector wants. In this case, biomass for alternative energy. So the selection process is critical because we have to know which crops we're going to use. And that has to be quantitative, not uh, empirical or, or subjective. We have to have a very clear screen of which species will fit the criteria that we want by end users. And then there's technology phase. That's when we do our research. That's actually development of products and end uses and modification of these plants for their potential use. It's only at that point we identify a breeding program for the species we're interested in. So in this case, there's Biomass Plus, and, uh, and I'll skim through the others, but you'll get the point now. Uh, we have a three-phase research program, selection, and identification of species, technology phase to development products from them, and end users identified at the outset who actually want to take up these products to end use and, and to commercial value, at which point we define the breeding program. Fish Plus, I think, is one of our most exciting programs because, interestingly, the fastest growing source of protein on the planet is aquaculture, not animals or not terrestrial animals. And if we actually look at aquaculture, we're going to feed the number of people we have to feed from farmed fish, from uh, farmed uh, sources of marine life, we are simply aren't going to be able to produce enough fish feed, and that fish feed is increasingly coming from declining resources like fish oil and fish meal, and of course, major plants like maize and soya that are used actually in fish feed manufacturing. Can we actually find commercially viable alternatives from plants that don't? grow as food crops, don't grow on land that's best suited to major crops, and actually provide nutritional value, starch and protein, and particularly uh, oil value that we can actually include in fish feed. So this is a really exciting opportunity, and we're actually doing this with another international centre, which is part of the CG, World Fish, based in Penang, which is in Malaysia, and that World Fish Centre, and us, across the Future Research Centre, working on this double benefit, if you like, of could we replace imported fish feed from major crops and can we produce nutritionally better fish feed from alternative plants? Because if it's probiotic, particularly if it's nutritionally valuable, the fish will be healthier. They won't need to be fed with antivirus to keep them alive because the death rate in farmed fish is huge because of disease. Smaller economic and carbon footprint and nutritional value to the people who eat the fish because the fish will be healthier and so will the people. So there's a real enormous benefit if we can actually make uh, alternative plant-based aquaculture feed. Starch Plus, same principle. Malaysia, I'm using Malaysia as an example because that's where we're based. It doesn't have to be Malaysia. These are all generic issues. Fish feed is global. Biomass is global. And so, so too is starch. And uh, developing economies like Malaysia import huge amounts of starch, primarily from cassava, for modification to make into packaging and products and materials that aren't actually for food use or related to food like uh, fake nuts and gelling agents, etc. Can we grow alternative starch crops that complement or replace the importation of cassava? 
on land that's currently not used by major crops. So again, identifying alternative starch crops, not out of just interest, but ones that actually provide economic return. Benefits either by replacing, complementing, or uh, adding to the uh, source of starch coming from the major crops. And uh, as economies develop starch for modification is a huge potential uh, and a huge demand. Modification, not just replacement of starch, but do we get novel products from these alternative starch sources? By modification, do we end up with end uses previously we didn't identify because the modification process led to new structures and constructs that we previously haven't got from the uh, preferred starches from the major crops. And food plus, I think you're getting the theme now, but it's basically diversification of the diet. You always talk about the narrow diet that we depend on, fewer and fewer plants, more and more processed food, and we have a huge potential from alternative plants for food, and later on for feed, but food in terms of dietary diversification, fruit and vegetables, nutritious foods, value-added product from alternative plants to actually enhance the food basket and diversify uh, the uh, consumption patterns increasingly of sedentary populations in uh, cities that depend on processed foods coming from uh, supermarket chains in which there's very little range in terms of dietary diversification. Finally, to get around to my favourite crop, so here's my biogramma which I've spent many years working on. This is an interesting project for us because most of our research actually was done in Africa or in India uh, and many years ago we started working on this crop where it's a central diversity there you can see it in West Africa. But by producing a mapping tool, which is actually the model that we're using now for our global mapping tool for, for crop base, we identified potential areas that could grow in Latin America and of course in subcontinental India, which is where we did a number of years of research. But interestingly, where I am in, in Southeast Asia, and in Southeast Asia, coming from here, the crop was taken to Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand about 600 years ago. And it changed its name, but it didn't change its genetics. So we've got a crop called uh, Kachangbogo or Kachang Kapri in Southeast Asia, but it's none, none other than Bambara groundnut, grown as it has been for many thousands of years in, in Western, uh, Eastern, Sub Saharan Africa. So we now have an opportunity to produce the first international breeding program for a crop that grows in this part of the world and has had its germplasm totally disconnected from the germplasm in West Africa for many hundreds of years. And the biggest disconnect, coming back to my original, original theme about knowledge systems, the biggest disconnect is between the knowledge system in this lady's head and the knowledge system in this farmer's head because they've never communicated. There's never been any exchange of knowledge between the farmer in Botswana and the farmer in Indonesia growing the same species. And it was interesting for us when we went to West, uh, when we went to uh, Java to meet these farmers. But they were growing. They they hosted us to a lunch, and every single plant there, except for maize, was an indigenous local plant. And that knowledge system that they had, they virtually had no published literature on most of these plants. But the interesting, common link for us was this crop here was the same plant as this lady was growing in Botswana. So for us, linking knowledge and research into an integrated breeding program is a priority and using digital technologies and, and social uh, networking to exchange knowledge which isn't necessarily what we would put in scientific publications is actually going to be the bedrock uh, of this new Bambara uh, Brown uh, breeding program using crop base. Okay, finally, and it's the scheme that I wanted to introduce to colleagues here, you may be interested in uh, participating or, or, or uh, contributing to this. When we actually established, uh, I'll show you the last slide first so you know what I'm talking about. When we said this is a legally separate entity, we had to pay an overhead to the University of Nottingham, and that was not as easy as you might have thought. The overhead, as an entity, the university said, fine, we'll take the overhead and you can have access to our facilities. But that was going to get very, very difficult to uh, ensure that we got the access to those facilities. So virtually all of our overhead is now allocated as studentships, because students have a fee and they're therefore entitled to access to facilities. So this scholarship program, 250 plus, I'm confident in saying is the largest postgraduate program ever on our class. across 250 years of postgraduate studentships. Not chronologically, but totally. So that allows us to allocate PhD and MRA studentships to work on unutilized crops or on major crops with links to unutilized crops, comparative platforms, research on major crops applicable, transferable to unutilized crops. So that plus 
It's a very important acronym there. But it gives us an in initial investment of 250 students on undutilized crops. Registered not at the CFFRC Research Centre, which no one's heard of, but the University of Nottingham, which many people have. So the qualification is the University of Nottingham qualification. But the supervision contracted by CFFRC in the first instance, 250, plus means two things, plus links to undutilized species, plus means more than 250, of course. And that's where we can say, contracted by CFFRC to the Nottingham University in the first instance, but to any other research partners to actually contribute to the scheme. To the programs or to the research priorities I've identified, of course, to new ideas that we haven't come up with yet. That scheme is now available for us to jointly supervise, either through CFFRC or the University of Nottingham, primarily the Malaysia campus, because in Nottingham UK or Nottingham China, in postgraduate qualifications to do research on unutilized crops. Fees, in our case, the 125 that the CFFRC uh, overhead is paying for is full fees and stipend and consumable costs, so no supervisor has to ask for extra money. Funding is actually provided. The university has been rather generous in providing 125 full fee scholarships, but of course is not paying the stipend and consumable costs as well. And other part of the university, interestingly, Peter Reading for one, Carol Wax stuff you may know, has already they put their hand up and put two PhD scholarships into the scheme. And of course, it's only just been launched. The first deadline was June 1st of this year. Next gen uh, deadline will be mid-July. So in the next month, we hope to attract a number of other potential partners who wish to do collaborative research with us, contributing in kind or in cash to do research in, uh, in this collaboration with the uh, CFFRC. Not just in uh, Malaysia, but also in other partner alliance centers like West Africa, East Africa, Southern Africa, uh, and hopefully in South Asia here in India. Okay, thank you very much for your, your patience. That's really a quick overview of what we've been doing, and I look forward to answering any questions if you have. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so I guess we've got about 10, 15 minutes for questions before we coffee, and there'll be further opportunity to, to interact with coffee. Those of you who are not running immediately to another another seminar. So I just I mean one thing interests me about the underutilized crop is, is what are you going to do about policy mm -hmm. or, or advocacy? Because of I mean, our own experience within the CRPs of having starting off with I see eighteen, fifteen legumes or whatever it was, and being told by the ISPC, no, 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 no. You know, it's all the time it's still losing. Yeah. Losing, even where diversity is important locally and can be, can be demonstrated. So, how are you going to go about the policy? Two things CFF, and that's biodiversity, in, in essence, uh, should be better at policy than we are. And the other is there's no point in policy, there's no evidence. So, our job is to provide evidence, and that evidence should be credible, respected evidence rather than evangelical evidence. So, as long as we provide evidence, people make their own minds whether it's useful. I think that'll be a stronger case than advocacy. I don't think we'd be backward in advocating, but it only be when we've got evidence to support it. One of our key, and I didn't mention that we are making a number of research theme director appointments, about five. One of them will actually be in marketing, which isn't policy, I know, but it's in getting things onto shelves that people then can say, there you are, we've actually got some use for this product. The other is to say, you do it for one crop, really why we've worked on Mambara for so long, concept is proof of concept to another crop is actually transferable. As long as we can do it for one crop, that evidence, I think, will be transferred. Okay, good. All right, questions? Yeah, Michael. How are you going to follow up with thousands of dollars? I've changed my mind completely because when we started, we said we would do exactly that. We prioritise which species are the next crops of the future, which are the priority crops that should become major crops. This system here, just example, exemplified by food base, food plus, sorry is actually not a prioritize. Because when you prioritize, you put another category in saying these are the crops of the future. And of course, everyone will say, well, what about this crop? Why isn't it in your candidate list? Or why isn't crop X in? Crop Y is. So that becomes a, a, an enormous dilemma. What we let happen, I think, is uh, the end user prioritize. In other words, if we said three plus, we'll actually identify which crops fit, if you like, the pull factor, the commercial demand for those plants. And therefore, those plants will become the plants that we do plant breeding on. Better example would be starch. We know that all plants in the world contain some form of starch, 
which ones are the ones that will produce the highest fraction of starch under the agroecological conditions that we're interested in different, different climates. The crops will then select themselves. We actually identify those crops as a result of the demand, in this case, for starch. I think that's an, it's a harder thing to explain, but it's an easier thing to do because we're then justifying the end use rather than the candidate list that we've grown up or somebody else has given us. Not sure if that answers your question, but I don't think that's a. Yeah. If you look at it globally, right, what ways could that be to really start biologizing? I still feel it's something which needs to be done. I mean, the investment will always be limited. Money will be limited, so yeah. we need to biologize. I think we, we prioritize both by, yeah, we have to pick certain plants that the one I quoted, the only species actually I've mentioned throughout this is Vanguard Grant, that's the only one that we've actually got enough evidence so far to close, to finish off to a point at which we can actually say we've developed that crop to, to end use and therefore there's a market, there's an end user for it. The priority will be how we set up systems, in other words, the approach we take that's rapidly transferable to other unutilized crops. So I think, even though I spent a lot of time agonizing over which crops were crops the future research centre to work on, I think that becomes a rod for our back, that becomes a restriction on us rather than an opportunity for us. You're right, the facility resources are very limited, but I think the resources should be spent on transfer of technology rather than the number of species we work on. So if we think of, for instance, genetic linkage mapping, any of the, the, the current biotechnology platforms, they should be transferable using one unused my crop as an example. It might be a closely related one, but the exemplar species then demonstrates that transfer of technology is viable to an unused one's crop. So I'm much more interested in the approach we take to different species than the species themselves. They, they'll come out of the, of the, of the system eventually. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, my question is uh, going to come back. I'm going to come back. Thank you. Uh, but, uh, now we are seeing it. Uh, <laughs> 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 not much, really, because it's not much. Going back to the uh, Indian and the conservation and the culture, I expected the uh, uh, my experience over the last, since I left Equisat actually, has been on unutilized crops. And my experience has been whenever you advocate research on unutilized crops, it does exactly what's just been mentioned. It falls off the bottom of the list because you've got all these other crops you've got to look at first. So no unutilized crop gets in to any list that's conventionally presented by policy makers or government agencies or donors. That's why we've set up an international center. And it's not an international center, it's an actual alliance. What we're really looking for our partners who want to work on unutilized crops who put their infrastructure and resources in to collaborate. And that collaboration is going to be key. Because what we've done previously is we've, we've worked for a short time on one crop, advocated it, it becomes a superfood or a wonder crop or something which we actually get run and we run away with the promotion of it. And then the evidence is simply not there. There's no market, there's no end use, there's no long term seed system to support it. So I think we have to demonstrate, and that's why we use this exemplar, we have to demonstrate how we can make particular crops sustainably useful in the long term. 
And I think that message will be much more powerful than which is the crop we're going to actually promote. Because I think there's a, there's a mindset here. People actually don't believe any of these crops have got an alternative to use. So there's no potential for them. They just slip out of, out, out of cultivation. And then we have to, have to go back a long way to actually find even germplasm, but there's no knowledge system related to the crops anymore. You know, it's not an easy, I don't pretend it's easy, but I don't think the alternative, which is fewer and fewer crops, and the assumption that the rest are no use, is actually, it's not credible any longer. We've been using the global germ product, and if they have a commercial type to it, do you reckon there will be some like that issue? There will be, and they will be on a case-by-case -case basis, and that will be thrashed out on a case-by-case -case basis. In fact, uh, one of the people involved in CFF, uh, Michael Herman, is actually, all of his work has been on CBD and, and, uh, and, uh, and the whole question of including unutilized crops in, in, in the treaty. So I think you're quite right, all of the IP issues will go. But I think primarily our purpose is, is, is to provide evidence where there has to be commercial sensitivity or an IP issue, we'll address that on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't think we should run away from one of the areas we don't particularly want to get involved in the pharmaceuticals because that really is risky and long term and more difficult for us to achieve just the fact that food and particularly feed will have commercial and public use. I think we can consider later commercial CDAs. Yeah, I'm just going to ask about the uh, uh, Yeah, just reminds us to thank Zaid again. So tea and coffee will be served. That will be a great opportunity.